Hey everybody, uh, my name is Jamie McLeod Skinner and I'm a proud rural Oregonian who believes in protecting our democracy and promoting good leadership. That's what electing good leaders is about, is a better democracy, people who can serve all Oregonians. And over the past few months, emerging rural leaders from across our state have reached out to me and, and asked for help in promoting their vision to uh, Oregon voters. So I had that same challenge when I was running as a rural Democrat. So I've joined with friends to help amplify the voices of rural candidates who are on the ballot this November. And we'll be hosting these panels on Tuesdays and Thursdays through election day. And so today I'm very excited to have three remarkable candidates, uh, Paige Hook, Hugh Pallack, and Arlene Burns. And let's uh, kick off by having you all tell us about your district and some of your key priorities. And Paige, let's start with you. And thank you so much, Jamie, for having uh, having this and hosting it. Um, it's quite an honor to be in the same space as these awesome candidates and you as well. Um, so I'm Paige Hook, and I am running for House District 17. House District 17 um, spans all the way up to Sanium Canyon, so um, one of the areas that has uh, suffered great tragedy from the wildfires, the Sanium uh, Fire, Beachy Creek, and Lion's Head. Um, so it spans all the way up to Idana, and then it goes um, over from Marion County over to Lynn County, where it hits Sio, Sweet Home, Waterloo, and Lebanon as well. Um, so it's a great big district because it's got the, the forest in between. Um, but I am a state and city councilor, and I'm a mom of three beautiful children, Jolene, Liam, and Merrick. They're seven, five, and three. So I have my hands uh, full, but I love a full plate. And um, I am uh, from this area. I graduated from Sio High School. Um, I am uh, a proud gun owner, but I also believe in gun sense. I'm a domestic abuse survivor. And um, I am just really excited to have the chance to represent my district in Salem because we definitely need our voices to be heard. Uh, I am going to do a little bit of a plug here uh, because I am someone who loves to educate and make sure people uh, stay informed. Um, but the last day to register to vote is November or sorry, October 13th, um, because then they're sending your ballots out. And uh, in Staten, we just got a 24 hour drop box at our public library. So um, there's a few others and um, you can check out my Facebook page at page for Oregon. Um, or uh, to find out where other drop boxes are. Nice, thanks Paige. And actually at the end, I always wrap up with a reminder of the October 13th deadline and then also um, information and at, invite you all to give some information as well. Uh, Hugh, let's go to you next. Um, can you talk about uh, the area you're looking to represent and some of your priorities? Sure, sure. Jamie, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, my name is Hugh Palsik, and I am the candidate running for Senate District 28. Um, I'm a candidate on the Democrat line and also the independent line uh, for the state of Oregon. So the district uh, is massive. It's a very large geographic area. It covers five uh, counties in which all five counties were actually on fire at the same time uh, in the most recent fires. So it's all of Crook County starting in the north, moving down, actually covers most of the rural southern area of Deschutes County. Then it tags into all of Klamath County as we head south. And then Jackson County, uh, it covers an area, it skirts past uh, around Medford on the east and north. Um, and then Lake County, almost all of Lake County. So it is a massive district, a, a lot of territory to cover. Uh, and a lot of issues. It, we are Senate District 28, and uh, we're aptly designated as 28 uh, for the fact that that's about where we uh, rest on, on most key indicators uh, in all 30 uh, senatorial districts. We're at or near the bottom uh, on just about everything, whether it's unemployment, food insecurity, uh, educational attainment, you name it. This district is in dire shape. It really needs strong leadership, and it needs that leadership to carry forward into Salem. And that's why I stepped forward. 32 years this district has been in the hands of one particular party, and really has offered up nothing more than grievance uh, politics um, and rhetoric that's very hollow and empty. And when those folks go to Salem, they truly don't have a voice when they get to Salem. Um, 
I want to be that voice. And I think there's also the opportunity to represent a great deal of all the folks in that district. That's why I'm running. Thanks, Hugh. And uh, that key point, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about so many uh, rural Democrats, rural progressives, rural independents who are running right now and the opportunity to really bridge that divide. We'll get into some of the details. I'll ask you about some of that later. But I also, when you talked about the boundaries, wanted to give a shout out to one of our uh, great uh, uh, rural Democrat who's serving right now is Jeff Golden, Senator Jeff Golden, who does a great job and carries it. But he needs, he needs some help uh, with um, some other folks who can help do some of that work and induce them bridging the divide. Arlene, let's uh, move to you. Tell us a little bit about uh, the area you're, you're looking to represent and some of your priorities as well. And you, you're you another one who already serves in office. Uh, tell us a bit about that. All right, well, um, Arlene Burns and I'm running to be the House Representative of House District 59. And um, our district is has parts of, uh, well, all of Jefferson County, which includes the Warm Springs tribe and Madras is the biggest towns and all of Wheeler County, which is not very populated, Fossil and Spray, Mitchell, parts of Deschutes County, Sisters, it, it bends around Redmond, Terrebonne, and, um, and then parts are most of Wasco County. So we have about uh, 50,000 registered voters in our district. It's been also uh, in Republican hands for 28 years. And um, so I felt it was really, really important to have a rural voice at the table in Salem that would stay put and actually work from a collaborative place. And I think our issues are really different as rural Democrats. Um, and I'm also the nominee for the Democratic Party, the Independent Party, and the Oregon Working Families Party. So I'm pretty excited to sort of have this, this breadth of support. And I think our issues um, are very different. Uh, water issues, agricultural issues, broadband infrastructure in a city is just an entirely different thing than in rural communities. So I, as my fellow companions here, really think it's important for us to have this attitude of collaboration and being at the table. And as you said, I am already involved in city government. I've, I'm on my third term as mayor and I've been really involved in climate issues. So resilience is one of my priorities and that's economic resilience, agricultural resilience, and really dealing with the issues of sharing water. Great, thanks. And uh, also the work you do currently as mayor, and I've, I've heard you speak before and heard you drill down to some of those issues. You've already have success at bridging the divide and doing some of that work. Uh, also, just by the way, uh, my family and I live in your district, so uh, looking forward to this conversation especially. But you've all talked about, I know from conversations I've had with you before, this um, the perspective that emerging rural leaders bring and, and how this can better serve all Oregonians. So I wanna start off by asking you all two questions, and this is the first, then I'll ask you some individual questions. But to this first question, and then let me see, why don't we start with you, Hugh, and then rotate around. What important perspective do you think that uh, emerging rural leaders and, and folks who are stepping forward as rural Dems or independents, uh, Working Families Party, bring, what would, what would uh, emerging rural leaders bring to the table um, and how does that better serve all Oregonians in Salem? Well, it's a good question. I, I think that it's, we need to be able to speak for all that we represent. And I think that gets lost along the way. So to truly be an emerging rural leader, you need to be able to A, listen uh, and engage your, your, um, your constituency. And you need to be able to communicate that in, in Salem. Um, one of the key pieces that I looked at in my campaign was to, when I look at my district as kind of land of the lost, so almost you know, put on a shelf by itself and I wanted to expose that. I wanted to put a face on that and actually bring other legislators <clears throat> down for tours of my district uh, and build that collegial relationship, but also get them to understand what we're dealing with. Because right now, what we have going into, into Salem is a voice that's very narrow um, and not speaking for everyone. So an emerging leader to me can bring that kind of impact and speak for all. Even in a dissenting uh, voice, I think they can do so. I think, I think that um, on that note, I think that 
that's what's lacking. I think if we bring that kind of uh, collective to the table in Salem, I think you start to snuff out much of the divisiveness that exists today. So there's the real, that's the golden key right there. Yeah, thanks. And the, the uh, there's a dominant party in Salem, but it tends to be more focused on urban issues. And, and even if there's an awareness and a sympathy and an interest, there's not some of that lived experience and basic understanding. And so that that bringing that to the table is just really, really powerful. Um, Arlene, let me go next to you. Kind of continuing on this on this thought and on this question, what what additional perspectives do emerging rural leaders bring and, and will bring to Salem? Well, I think um... Uh, my, with my experience as mayor, we had a big train, train crash in 2016, and that was when I started making my trips to Salem to testify for oil train safety and also to try to bring some funding back to Mosier to recover from our crash, and also we've had three major fires. So what I've found is we are a refreshing voice in Salem, and actually to be able to go and articulate the needs of a community that has very different values. And I, I feel we're holding some of the most, the greatest treasures of Oregon in our rural areas and, and including um, wind and sun and space and nature that we also cherish. And um, it's really important for us to be there at the table and um, work with state agencies. And as my friends here have said, to, to be in collaboration means to show up and put our heads together and kind of find ways to bring the, the wealth of, of resource back to our district. So I think that's our great perspective is, you know, I'm so thankful and glad we live in these smaller quiet communities where community really is community or can be, and we might know a lot about each other sometimes too much, but uh, this is the chance for healing in so many ways. And, um, and I, I, I don't know, I think that it is gonna be a challenge, but I think if we focus on what we have in common and find these common goals that we can work for, it's the best place to start. And that's where as an independent, as a Democrat working families, you know, we're coming there with our hearts open and our minds open. Thank you. And then Paige, uh, just even before I turn this, this question over to you and, and get your thoughts on it as well. One of the things that always really, I, I just deeply admire about you and, and always see you doing is you really step up for everyone. If someone's being dissed, it doesn't matter what their political perspective, what their background is, you're like, no, we can do better than that. And I constantly see that from you. And so I just, um, I see it from the outside of, but you know, what are the things that you can add to this, uh, this, this conversation of what rural um, emerging leaders bring? So one of the things that I'm really impressed by a lot of the rural candidates that we have running this year is um, we aren't cookie cutter Democrats. We are um, focused on our districts and what our districts need, need. And that is the kind of candidate that I am. Um, I, you know, like I said, I grew up in this area and this is where I want to be. And so I want this place to be amazing. And it feels like it kind of just hasn't really progressed. Um, and so for me, I just want people to know um, what, what I can bring as an emerging rural leader uh, and as, a, I guess, a, a rural Democrat, um, what makes it unique for, for our district is it's strategic. It's strategy. Um, we have a super majority that's not going to get lost in this election. Um, it's not gonna go anywhere. And so we need a voice at that decision-making table where we can actually be in there before the bills are drafted, before they go out to a hearing room um, so that I can advocate to actually get our voices heard because what happened with cap and trade for two sessions now is we were not consulted. No one came out to our district. I called, I asked. The closest that they came was Salem and Springfield. And that's an, about an hour from uh, places like Idana and Cascadia, which they, Idana can't even download a PDF file with the internet that they have. So they can't see the posting of the hearing. They don't know that it's going on. They have no public transportation to get there. And their average household income is about $29,000 a year. So we need voices in that room and voices that aren't afraid to stand up 
and, and say the things that people might not want to hear and um, aren't afraid to say, hey, wait a second, you're not looking at it from this perspective and this perspective. Um, one of the things that uh, I really try hard to do is to make sure that even if I have a stance on something that I always leave room to consider another perspective because there's always another perspective. There's always another uh, answer. There's always another way that you can solve a problem. Um, so anyway, uh, the, I just feel like that is what, um, what I can bring. And, you know, I have, I have a, a lot of experience um, that you can actually see and uh, of where I have stood up to even powerful leaders that are currently elected. Um, because, you know, I don't like bullies. I don't like people that that say um, that that they want to take and take and take and not give to us. And um, I can tell you that because places like uh, and okay, don't get me wrong. I love I love urban areas too. They have their own unique character, and there's a place for them in Oregon. But in our rural areas, we don't have access to the same opportunities as they do. Um, our internet is just one example, only one example. There's many examples. Um, but when you can't even download a PDF or you don't have options for internet at all, that's a problem. That's, that's making it so people don't have access to information. And that's not, that's not justice. And I fight for justice. Thank you. And uh, ironically, as you were talking about internet, mine started slowing down. So I didn't even hear that last bit of your statement because we live in rural areas. But I, I love your um, this this concept of redefining Democrat and broadening the sense of what a Democrat is, and that that sense of the values and the care and 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 the progressive ideas, and and, uh, and sometimes folks will also, um, you know, racial justice is so important in our country, and we have diverse communities in rural areas as well that are twice as not being heard. Um, and so, it's, you know, some of our panels have included um, uh, BIPOC emerging leaders as well who are running in areas and it's really exciting, but that's, that's who we are as rural communities and that stepping up and making sure voices are heard. It's so critically important. And I, I love the fact that you're not afraid. I mean, this is, this is your brand page. You're, you're not afraid to, to political speak maverick speak for your community and, and speak for your neighbors. And that's, it's, it's really powerful. And that uh, re, it that will help us bridge the divide because people, in order to feel that the, the, in order to bridge the divide, people need to feel like like we care, and yeah. you all are talking about that and doing that. So thank you. Can um, I add one thing to the BIPOC uh, statement that you made? Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think that there's a this is a really important thing to highlight um, because of housing costs, our BIPOC community is getting pushed out of urban centers and into rural areas. Um, and so we need to remember that we should be focusing on races like ours. Our, our party should be focusing on that and they're not. Um, they're leaving us in the dust and it's people like you, Jamie, that are lifting us up. And we're lifting each other up with hashtag Team Rural Oregon. Um, we're using, a lot of us are using that to draw more attention to our races because we're not getting the attention. And we need us to be elected so that we can help our rural areas move forward so that we aren't taking the BIPOC, BIPOC community backwards as they yeah. move out here. Well, and even uh, you, uh, you all, a couple of you mentioned fires earlier. I mean, I think of Southern Oregon as well and how so many uh, vulnerable lower income communities and um, Latinx communities were uh, you know, disproportional losses in housing. And now as there's a look at redeveloping housing, to make sure we're protecting affordable housing. I mean, that's not that that's for our vulnerable communities, our communities of color, that's for our ag workers. It, it's critical to our economy. It's critical to uh, justice and stability in our state. So areas that have been so hurt and are so vulnerable had housing crises to begin with. It's now that much more of a crisis. So having people with really core community-based values who also understand and represent will fight for rural areas. That's why this election and, and all of your voices are so key. I mean, I'm not a candidate. You guys are doing it. So, so I so respect and appreciate the fact you're stepping up. Let me ask us kind of a, a softer question, but just more to just get a sense of who you are. And I think uh, Arlene, let's start with you this time. Um, what historical figure or leader inspires you and why? Well, 
uh, this is an interesting one because I'm inspired by quite a lot of different uh, historical leaders, but the one that kept popping into my mind was the Dalai Lama, is the Dalai Lama. And because he was chosen as a politician, we're all getting to choose it, or maybe we're chosen as well. And, um, and I, I met him way back when I was a youngster uh, living in the Himalayas and have followed the course of him overcoming this hardship where his people lost their country and he's been a refugee pretty much almost all his life now. And he has never uh, varied from his platform of compassion and humor and love as far as um, being able to overcome almost all obstacles and find ways to go forward. And it's fascinating because his message is not a religious message, it's a spiritual message but it's one that has this utmost level of integrity and kindness as its foundation and root. So he's my guy. Yeah, thank you. Um, Paige, what historical figure or leader inspires you and why? Oh goodness, well, I'm gonna definitely highlight a woman for this one and she is beloved by most every American. Um, she fought for uh, the BIPOC community when it was uh, really not, um, okay to do that. And that's Eleanor Roosevelt. And one of the, my favorite things that I feel like is kind of one of the mottos of my campaign and the way I live my life is, uh, she said, do what you feel in your heart to be right for you'll be criticized anyway. Uh, <laughs> you'll be damned if you do and damned if you don't. So, um, that's, that's really, that encompasses kind of who I am and, and what drives me. And I think on that a lot of, it doesn't really matter what I do. I get attacked from all sides because I don't pass purity tests for people. Um, and those purity tests are like, do you align with every single box that needs to be checked? And no, I don't. And I won't agree with everyone. And, um, I'll, but I'll listen. I'll always listen. Thank you. Uh, Hugh, um, historical figure or leader that inspires you and why? Wow. Well, um... This is a longtime favorite, so it's an easy answer for me. It's 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 Bobby Kennedy, uh, RFK, uh, really um, standing up for people that didn't have the power, didn't have the ability to stand up for themselves. Um, I see a lot of that, by the way, in in it in everywhere I travel in our in my district, I assume in others. The fact you know, Jamie, you brought up uh, the fires in Southern Oregon, and you know. A, the disproportionate number of people that have been actually displaced that are really uh, lower income and, and minority. And you look at that and you go, okay, when we rebuild, what will that look like? That's going to take strength. It's going to take someone that's going to stand up and go, no, we're not going to change uh, how we're looking at our communities uh, solely for um, you know, a financial gain in, in redeveloping that area. I really am concerned for that. I look at the agricultural uh, work in our region and uh, I see people that really need our help. And especially, you know, I was in Bend when ICE arrived uh, <laughs> with the bus. I don't know if you heard that uh, made all the news. Um, that's just, to me, that's where real leaders need to step up and, 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 and speak out uh, when they see that. So that's kind of where I come from. It's from the heart. And I, I, I look at Bobby Kennedy as an example of that. Not only that, but uh, his role in uh, Native American um, in the tribes that he, that he fought for and, and poverty, which is a big issue. One in five, almost one in five in my district are at or below the poverty level. You know? And so there is so much work to do in so many ways uh, in this district, but it's going to require strength. And it's not easy enough to just use some scapegoat rhetoric and blame someone or tilt at the governor and say, here's all the problems. And that, you know, criticism doesn't solve much. Uh, we need answers and we need people strong enough to, to speak to that. So that, so Bobby Kennedy really is my, my idol when it comes to that. Awesome, thank you. 
Um, let me get into some individual questions. And uh, Arlene, I think it's it's your turn. So you talked a little bit, and and I've uh, I've heard you talk about your background before, um, and you you know you talked about some of the st stuff you've done as mayor. But uh, but what specifically in your background prepares you for this role? Well, um, uh, in my youth, and after I graduated from college, I was um, an international guide, a river guide. And I took people from all walks of life, pretty much all over the world in different capacities, mostly on wilderness trips where people were stripped of the things that defined them and put in, uh, in most cases, a raft or a kayak or um, trekking. And, um, and, it, and my job was to guide them and to give them the tools so they could have their own experience. And it was also really overcoming a lot of obstacles and figuring out how to work together and find what people's strengths were and put them in the areas where their strengths would shine. And um, so I think that was is one of the skills that I think translates to almost everything in life I've done since. And I'm also, I've been in film production a lot and I would say my specialty is as much as anything is dynamic logistics. It's like creative problem solving and figuring out the solutions. And I sort of thrive in, okay, there's an issue. It's not an issue. Let's find the solution. Let's get to these, where are the resources? So uh, government in general doesn't think very fast. I'm a little used to solving things in a little bit faster timeline, but I think we need that invigoration and we need this out of the box thinking that isn't coming from a party line per se, that's coming from a place of, okay, here's where we are now, how do we solve it? We're all in this together, let's get it done. Yeah. Um, let's, let's uh, page onto you and let's, let me dig a little bit deeper into that because we're talking a lot about, or um, there's often this, this discussion of the divide and, and one party thinks one thing and another uh, party thinks another thing or members of that party. But I would say all voters, uh, regardless of party, really want to know that their elected representatives will be accountable to them. So uh, what are you doing now to demonstrate to your future constituents that you will be accountable to them? Uh, that is a great question. And it is one of my passion points, accountability. It's something that I can't wait to get to uh, the Capitol and hold both Democrats and Republicans accountable. Um, what I have been doing to show that I uh, am accountable to my community is I, I make sure that I say what my intention is. I'm going to represent all people in my district, whether you can vote or can't vote, whether you're Republican, a Democrat, a non-affiliated voter, it doesn't matter. You're a person. And, um, you know, in some of your most trying times, like these wildfires that we've experienced, you know, I don't walk up to someone or answer my phone and ask them what party they're from. I don't ask them uh, if they're a voter or not. You, I, I help them because that's what you're supposed to do as a representative. Um, you're supposed to be able to help them navigate these exact kind of situations where they don't know where to get the information. They don't know what options are out there. And so, um, I mean, if anyone, if you have been following me or even if you haven't, uh, again, check out my social media, you can see that during these wildfires, I actually suspended um, my fundraising and, and the campaigning portion uh, for, for two weeks just to have all hands on deck because this is my community and I wanna make sure people have information. And I've had phone calls with people where, you know, one of them said to me, I can't advocate for myself. I just don't have time. And I said, well, that's what my job is. You know, that's what, I, that's what I'm here to do. I mean, that's what I'm going to be. And just as a, a fellow uh, community member, um, that's just how I live my life. So um, other things that I'm doing is, uh, you know, I'm not taking uh, tens of thousands of dollars from uh, corporations. Um, my opponent is, but I have decided to not take any money from um, corporations, the bigs, like big pharma, big oil. I'm keeping it grassroots. Um, as much as I possibly can. And I just think that that sends a message to people that you aren't bought. Um, and I'm not saying that someone is if they take that money, but it, it's the perception that's there. And perception means a lot. So um, I'm also uh, someone that has taken uh, donations. Uh, I have supporters from 
all sides of, of politics. I've got non-affiliated voters that have uh, donated to me. I have Trump supporters that have, uh, that have donated to me, progressives. I have a bunch of different people that are coming in, putting their money to support me because they know that I'm genuine when I say I'm going to represent everyone. I'm going to protect our forests, our farms, our small businesses, um, you know, our, our, our working parents and our teachers as we navigate this COVID-19 crisis. Um, Miriam Cummins, who you had on your, uh, on your last um, one of these Facebook Lives, um, you know, we did a call to action uh, together to some uh, organizations to have them step forward with us so that we can hopefully um, come up with some ideas to take to legislators uh, to help support parents of young children, you know, give them some type of protection, but not on the backs of businesses because the, because businesses can't take any more. They can't take any more. We can't take any more taxes. We can't take any more um, burdens on businesses right now during this uh, COVID-19 crisis. So um, yeah, we, we were talking about uh, looking into seeing if we could find some type of a ADA type protection for parents with young children because they legally can't leave their kids at home. Yeah, yeah that, that lived experience and really understanding the impact. I was talking to a small business owner in, um, in Central Oregon after COVID hit and she said, you know, it's great. There are some things that, that have stepped up, but no one's actually asking us what we need. And making sure that resources, the very limited resources that are there match people's needs. That's, that comes only from either asking people or having that experience and understanding it. And that accountability piece is so key. Um, Hugh, um, we were talking a lot about different needs that we have uh, throughout, our, throughout rural areas. What are some of the needs that are not being met in your district? And what do you think the biggest barrier is um, to, to not having them met? Um, and, and how can you change that? Well, well uh, that's quite a, quite a question. I, <laughs> there, because it, we could be here all night. No, I'm just kidding. There is a lot to that. But um, the needs, there, there are many. Um, and that, that comes from neglect over years. Um, it really has. Um, to give you an idea, I, I, if you haven't been to my website yet, it, you know, it calls out I'm a man with plans. And I, I, I certainly do. I have a broadband for all plan. Lake County, by the way, 56% of Lake County is not connected to the internet, let alone whether or not they can afford it. They're simply not connected. So when we talk about distance learning uh, in a rural area, um, we're in a world of hurt right there. And I see that the opportunity of broadband infrastructure and how important it is, just even for people to participate in government. How, how can people in my district participate in Salem in a hearing, for instance, um, when broadband does not exist. So I look at broadband as a key, key component. And I also see it as a stimulator when we talk about jobs and we talk about economy. It, it actually fingers out in a lot of different directions. Um, it's going to uh, affect the quality of life overall, whether it's telehealth, uh, whether it's distance learning, uh, just overall, even agricultural, it will pay uh, dividends over time. So I, I see that, I see renewables, I see, uh, you know, my district could be a true power broker. When uh, I was in college, uh, I interned for and later worked for a senator uh, from the Western New York region, a state senator. Um, that region was a power broker. Um, and you, you, there, never mind political party affiliation, it really became more regional for, for New York State overall. And working as a region is important. So the, the needs are many, but I think broadband right off the bat would change a lot of directions that we're going. Um, you know, you mentioned, uh, Paige, you mentioned uh, um, campaign uh, finance um, and some of the, you know, highly funded folks. There's a measure, uh, 107, I think, um, that would be worth supporting. Uh, it's a step in the right direction. Now, you know, I've jokingly said, but there's a lot of truth to it. You know, I think that uh, these these individuals should have to wear uh, kind of a NASCAR suit with the emblems and logos on it of those that actually are their donors so that we would actually know who owns them when they're out there. Um, that's a big problem. I think it really does compromise democracy greatly 
especially when you're supported by something like Big Pharma and we're talking about insulin cap uh, pricing. Um, and all of a sudden you're, you're in a quandary. So there's, there's a lot that needs to be tackled. But I think right off the bat for my district alone, perhaps others, I, to me, it's, it's somewhat low hanging fruit to go after uh, broadband because it transcends all party lines. It will, it will benefit all across the board. So I see that as a start. Yeah, and uh, just to the ballot measure you mentioned, so there's a ballot measure to um, allow for uh, campaign finance um, uh, limits and uh, contribution sure. limits. And yeah. so the, the Oregon Supreme Court said it's now allowed, but it's still on the ballot. So yeah, please support that one because we want to keep heading in the direction of more accountability. And uh, I like that NASCAR jacket idea you had, uh, Hugh. I think that's a good, that's a good one. Um, I mean, this is such a big topic. Let me uh, um, share it with you as well, Arlene. Uh, what are some of the needs that are not being met in your district? Because also you're looking at two different parts of the state, kind of the southern part of the state, Hugh, and the northern part of the state, Arlene, along the, the Columbia, the, the Gorge. Uh, what are some of the needs not being met in your district? And also what's your vision for the future of your district? Well, um, we also have uh, uh, quite a lot of diversity in our district um, here in the Columbia River and with our proximity to Portland, we have uh, availability to, uh, that a lot of pe other people in the district might not. Um, I totally agree that broadband and infrastructure for um, this new economy based on renewable energy is our greatest path forward and will give people in our, our areas access to education and to be able to work and to have access to what people in, in urban areas just assume is a God-given right at this point. Um, in the Warm Springs tribe, they have been dealing with water issues for a really long time. And it is just heartbreaking that this has not been solved. So um, tribal dignity to really bring them up and give them a voice in Salem and be their advocate is one of my really big points. I, I feel a, a great affinity to our tribes. And uh, one of my areas of great interest is in agriculture and how we transform our agriculture. And that's our cattle ranches, our grass farms, our orchards, our vineyards towards a regenerative agriculture, which is basically going back how we farmed 100, 200 years ago. And also with the technology of the future that is is really thinking of farms as whole ecosystems. And I, my vision is that we could be a template for the rest of the country and how you could, you could enable resources towards this way of farming, which a lot is just knowledge. It's just giving that resource of knowledge and, um, and to really think about these various facets of farming, which are all very different. And all of this, if we don't get this climate thing right, everything is going to be harder. So it all comes into this big umbrella of resilience and dealing with the, the monster in the room, which is carbon emissions into our atmosphere. And I know people say, okay, we're not compared to a lot of people, the bigger contributors of the problem. And in a lot of ways that makes us more able to solve it on a micro scale then. So um, I think that we really can participate by being an, an example and a template. You know, we're strong in community. What I really hope is that I get to work with the two of you guys, because it would be wonderful for us to collectively represent rural Oregon and basically infect everybody with this enthusiasm and, and knowledge. So I hope that is able to happen. Nice. I will say we're not using the word infect in the era of COVID. Oh, yes. Just. <laughs> No, but I love hearing uh, rural Dems talk about agriculture and talk about this partnership on moving forward on uh, climate resiliency from an ag perspective, from a rural perspective. It always just gets under my skin when there's this pitting of one side versus the other. And those of us who live in rural areas know that, no, our survival, the, the survival of our ag economy is, is based on our ability to, to get this right and work together in partnership to get it right. And so it, it means so much to have you uh, speak, speak of that. And then also the broadband issue. So again, I, I live in your district. I serve on the Jefferson County Education Service District Board and we are in the process now and that includes, uh, our service area includes the Warm Springs Reservation. And 
some of our students, uh, we can't even give them hotspots to use because they just simply don't, not only don't have broadband, they don't even have, their, their phones don't even work in terms of having cell service for a hotspot. And so, you know, the challenge right now to educate our kids with so many basic limitations on, um, on internet access, they can't be watching this conversation right now because they just don't have the resources. We're in the information age. And so the information highway is a public roadway that should be paved. Um, and go with that with the analogy. But, um, you know, we, but there is also this sense of, you know, when we hear about the urban rural divide, we often hear about these misconceptions about rural communities. And Paige, let me go next to you. What, what would you say are some of the most common misconceptions that you hear people say about rural communities? Yeah, so um, I, there's a few of them. Uh, first off, I like to call it the rural urban divide because rural needs to come first uh, for once uh, now. Okay, so that. anyway, um, one of the things is it feels like sometimes people don't think that we need jobs out here. Um, one of the things that uh, I would like to see the next go around that people start talking about uh, the infrastructure that we need for um, delivering clean energy to areas of the state is for those clean energy jobs to come out to our districts and give us the outdoor jobs that we want that are union living wage jobs. And at the same time, you dig those ditches for the conduit that also delivers broadband internet. Um, it's you know two birds, one stone. Um, so sometimes I just feel like it's a, a take, take, take. They want to take away our logging jobs. They want to take away our mills. And I understand that, you know, we have to do something about uh, climate change. Um, I, I believe in science, but I also don't want that to be on the backs of people that are already struggling. Um, and so we have to come up with solutions. If you're going to take something, you don't take from the poor and then just keep taking you have to give something back. You have to lift them up. You have to help them out. Um, and I just didn't see a whole lot of that happening yet. Um, and then another misconception uh, is kind of the same thing that, that we don't care about, about climate. And that's not true. Um, uh, like Arlene had said, uh, we, we work the land. We love the land. You guys call it climate, uh, cli uh, climate change. And we uh, we call it, um, you know, being good stewards of the land. We just talk about it differently. You know, we care about our our earth. Um, we care about the soil. There's there's whole sciences based on soil, um, and so that's another thing. Um, and then also that we're all red districts. That like we're all just completely conservative districts. And that's not true either. Um, in my district, we actually have more non-affiliated voters than we have Republicans. Uh, so, you know, I just kind of want people to know that, you know, we are diverse out here. Um, and when we don't get uh, attention from the larger uh, organizations um, the, that, that don't want to give our districts the time of day, um, including our own parties, uh, organizations, you know, that we aren't worth it to them to, to put their effort and their money and their people and their time into us. Um, you know, you are forgetting in my district, well over 10,000 people, like, like that we don't, you know, that we don't matter, that we don't exist. And so um, I just, I want people to know that, you know, we're not all just Trump supporters out here, but yeah, we have Trump supporters. And you know what? I'm going to represent them too, and I'm going to find middle ground. And I have found middle ground with a lot of them. Um, I'm not here to change people's parties. I am here to bring great things to our district and to get us the things that we need. So um, those are like three things. It's just that we, it seems like people think we don't need jobs out here, that we don't care about climate, and that we're all just um, huge red districts. But it's not well, true. You know, in my experience of traveling around our state, I find some of the most progressive people are actually in rural areas because this is a tremendous sense of independent minded and just tell it like it is. And that sometimes um, is is seen as um, 
uh, in front to kind of a certain approach that some people like to see uh, in their conversations in politics. But if you listen to what people are saying and you're talking about the issues, powerfully progressive and very um, innovative and, and, and very uh, focused on resiliency, focused on community, all these concepts that are uh, concepts that at the heart and the values of the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party talks about, it's people living in action, sometimes doing it a bit differently, but still still practicing those values. And that's why I get frustrated with some of the disconnect and also that sense of stewardship that you mentioned. So even uh, folks who, who um, harvest some of the wood from our forest, it's still the sense of it's for the long haul, uh, protecting the resource in the long run. So, so in a manage, uh, sustainable management of those resources. And, and I, I like the fact you pointed out um, uh, the use of stewardship, because I used to joke that like, you know, sustainability stewardship, one part of the state, people use the word stewardship, another part sustainability. But if you're actually talking about the ideas, people are pretty much talking about the same thing, but we have our different buzzwords and every code words we use, yeah. but we need to stop getting caught up in those code words and really kind of get into those ideas, flesh them out and just start getting things done and taking care of people. Cause it, you know, the need is so great right now. Um, and then just to, to wrap up on this point, um, you know, we've talked a lot about um, being divided on along ideological lines. Hugh, um, what about bridging the divide? Where would you start in the, this conversation of bridging the divide? Well, we, we really won't realize our true potential as a state, an overall state, until we do bridge that divide, in my opinion. And, and where, where to start? And, and I, I draw from my experiences in watching uh, Senator Massiello back in New York take senators and, and assemblymen from New York City into Western New York for a weekend and watch him literally work them through, you know, it, it would, it was the whole, you know, kind of tour that by the time they left, they, they got us just in a short two or three day stay. And he reciprocated, he would go see them. It was collegial. And it was, by the way, it was party lines didn't matter. Um, where that really paid off then is it, it enhanced his seat at the table. If there was a, a particular issue or a bill that was going to be uh, extremely impactful to our region, he had people he could draw on right there and said, you were there with me last, you know, last August, I had you here. So to me, we need to bridge through, believe it or not, a lot more work that way. Um, walking out, and I, I'm not going to get into the walkouts, but walking out really short circuits any opportunity for, for building that bridge. So right off the bat, I think we need to extend that hand on both sides of the aisle and really work towards getting everyone to understand that you can experience four seasons in a day in this state. Uh, you know, I mean, really. So it, getting people to understand how different our state is from all reaches would be a key component because when it's crunch time, you're gonna be able then, you're gonna be a lot closer with everyone to be able to share those experiences, draw from them and, and, and be able to be more persuasive when necessary. So that's where I would begin it, uh, right there. Uh, bringing people out of their elements, getting them out of their comfort zones, getting them to see things that they wouldn't ordinarily see. And I can tell you, uh, traveling my district, and I've spent a lot of time corner to corner of this district, um, everything you're saying is indeed true. The, yeah, Paige and Arlene, they, they, you see folks of all walks of life in rural areas. Uh, Jamie, you pointed out most progressive people that you've run into are in rural areas. I, ditto, I've seen that. And um, they're there. Um, now it's a matter of making sure that we collect those voices, bring them together. I like to tell people, I'm not an expert in anything except maybe college grade top ramen that I could make, but, <laughs> but bringing people together, that's something I actually have some experience doing and, and some success in doing. So I can get everyone to a table and get everyone to talk. And that's where I think my strengths lie. Um, and that's where I would start, you know, and then build off of that foundation. Because honestly, 
and I can take it for my district or I can take it for the whole state. We are not going to be our best until we do that, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. And actually, we've had some of that as part of our track record in the past. I mean, we've had legislators who've done that. We just really need to get back to it. And we mentioned uh, really strong, passionate progressives who live in rural areas. It brings to mind uh, Bill Whitaker, uh, who recently passed away in Union County, a dear friend. Um, and he was a champion of that solid core values, progressive values in, uh, in the heart of a, of a very rural and very red area. But he also built those relationships with his neighbors and he was very well respected and very well loved. Um, let's, um, I, I wanna wrap things up and I was gonna end with it, but Paige, just cause I know you're passionate about dates. I am gonna say to everyone, the last day to either check your registration or register to vote is October 13th. Uh, once you get your ballots, mail them or drop them in a drop box early because it's going to take longer. Uh, there's concerns about it taking longer to get there. Um, so I will preface it with that. And then I'm going to ask all of you to just do a quick round. And how do people learn more about you? What's your website? And then one key asker or key point. Uh, Arlene, let's start with you. Okay, my website is voteforarlene.com. And um, I have quite a lot of information on there. And um, I think one of the key points that is uh, obvious tonight is we're all coming from a very similar place of wanting to roll up our sleeves and get to work from a place of bringing things together and healing versus tearing things apart. And it's really exciting being on this panel with the two of you, the three of you, because we're all about hope. And, um, and despite all the hard stuff that we're dealing with, and you know, that suffering is inevitable, but I think we all have this optimistic view of, okay, it can be better, we can help it be better. And probably that's why we're all stepping up to the plate right now and going, okay, instead of complaining about it or being a victim, how can I help, how can I help the people in my community and in my district and in the state? And um, yeah, yeah so we're done. I hope Let's we get, get a done. chance to. We're, we're almost out of time. Paige, your website and uh, any any last thought you may have uh, before yeah. we have to wrap Awesome. Up. So my website is uh, pagefororegon.com. Um, my email address is pagefororegon at gmail.com. And you can text me 971-328-0928. Text me, call me. Um, I have people do it all the time already. So, um, and then like me on Facebook, all of my social media handles are Page for Oregon. And I think for me, the takeaway is um, that, and I'm seeing it in, in both of these other candidates, is we need a softer approach. What has been happening has been uh, like toddlers fighting. It's been uh, one pushing, the other one saying, I'm leaving. And you know, I'm mom, I'm gonna come in there and I'm gonna ask, ask them to find another way. Um, I, I identify more with the type of style that we saw with um, Mark Hatfield, Wayne Morse, Bob Straub, Tom McCall, you know, that, that bipartisanship um, where you don't have to agree on everything. I'm progressive, but I know that doesn't work shoving it down the throats of people that don't agree with every single stance. You have to balance your values, figure out what your core values are, and then um, just, just work with people from there. Balance your community needs, balance your individual constituent needs. Nice. And one thing I'll just add, it's page P-A-I-G-E. In terms of spelling, you said page for Oregon. So I just want to remind people that it's P-A-I-G-E for page. Um, and Hugh, let's wrap it up with you. How do people uh, find out more about you and last thoughts? You can go to hughpalsic.com. That's a great place to go for starters right off the bat. Of course, there's all the other uh, social media platforms to go to. Um, I have a very, actually, I have a, a movie review for you too, real quick. Uh, Kiss the Ground. Uh, you should, if you haven't seen it yet, do see it. It would reinforce a lot of what Paige and Arlene have said tonight. Kiss the ground. Woody Harrelson narrates, so it it and it's done very very well. You do see that. I have two small asks. One, I would ask that not only in my district but throughout the state of Oregon, well, the whole nation for that matter, we need to actually approach this election season with very open minds, and we need to do our due diligence. So I, I offer that up. Hear hear folks out wherever they're coming from. It's okay to, as Paige pointed out. It's okay to have a different uh, opinion. 
on items, but do do listen. So that's one. Um, I believe democracy dies without dialogue. I really do. And I think it's suffering right now uh, in many respects, just the way that things are polarized. And that's unfortunate because I think the citizens really lose in the end of the day. I have put out there myself for Senate District 28, the opportunity, uh, and people think of a debate, an opportunity for a debate with, with my opponent, uh, Senator Linthicum. He has, uh, to this point, has uh, not taken me up on that. And that's unfortunate because I don't see a winner or a loser in a debate. If we do this right, and we get back to really old school <laughs> elections, we should be talking about solving our problems and challenges together and, and having the best ideas. And that's really, you know, throw away the red balloons and the blue balloons and the streamers and the signs and get down to the business at hand. And that's really solving our problems. We can't do that if we're not in the same room. So, Senator, if you're out there, um, please. Uh, and, and for the constituents in, in my district, uh, I'd ask for it. I, if only for the dialogue itself, there really is, there shouldn't be a winner or a loser in a debate. Everyone should win by generating the best ideas to move, move us forward. That's, that's my ask. Go vote. That's, yeah, no, that's such a key point. I remember when I was running against Greg Walden, it took a, a TV station calling him and essentially challenging him to a debate before he'd even respond. I mean, I even asked him in person, he agreed in person months before, and then he just, he refused to, uh, he refused to step up. And that's, I mean, that's true across the board. That's true for uh, Democrats who have have competitive races. That's true for Republicans who have competitive races as well. And I really appreciate your point of saying, here's someone out, uh, vote, vote values and vote integrity. I mean, making sure we have the best leaders to step up and really represent us at a state. That's so important for protecting our democracy, protecting the sense of who we are. And we're, as Oregonians, we have a lot of diversity of thought. Let's make sure we have folks who can represent all Oregonians. It's so important. And those of you who've been listening, now you get to, you get to see, I was able to show off why I'm so proud of so many of the emerging rural leaders who are stepping up to run and to show what incredible folks we have who are running across our state. If you live in their districts, please reach out, vote for them, support them. And even if you're outside their districts, look them up, help them out, whether it's through a contribution or helping to get the word out to their constituents. This is the kind of quality we have in our state. And so I strongly encourage you to support the folks who are running. And just to that last point, vote. Your, your voice is your vote, it's your power. Don't let anyone tell you that, uh, that your, your vote doesn't matter because it does. We're all depending on it. So get out there and vote. Thanks everyone, thanks for joining me and I'll see everyone Thank else you, next Jamie. time. Thank you so much, Jamie. Take care, uh, take care. great folks.